Now, when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the day is now the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have only five loaves here and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. This is what we'll be looking at today. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of the broken pieces left over, And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. As we look at this series of He's Still Shepherd, the theme today, the theme today is He Still Satisfies. He Still Satisfies. Will you bow with me in prayer as we continue today? Father, quiet Quiet my heart today. Give me clarity of thought and of speech. We pray against the enemy who is ever present. We pray against the enemy and his demons, and we ask God by the name and by the blood of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, that you would cast him out of this space and place that from wall to wall and floor to ceiling and every pew and every heart and every person who is here today and everyone who will listen to this message, we pray that through the indwelling and the anointing of your Holy Spirit that you will speak to our hearts where we need it most and remind us that not only are you still shepherd, but you and you alone satisfy. And in that, God, may we stand And may we move forward in your strength, in your power, for your victory, and for your glory. And this I pray in the name of our good shepherd, who is still shepherd, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. The first thing that I see as I look at this passage, and again, it's just just a few words. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven words. Seven words for this kind of focus point on this message is this, and you probably could have figured this out. The good shepherd still satisfies. The good shepherd still satisfies. Remember that Jesus has fed the 5,000 through this miracle, starting out with um, some loaves and fish that he blessed and broke and gave to the disciples, and they passed them out. And and verse 20, and I've kind of highlighted it so we would just kind of focus in on this, um, and they, they all, they all ate and were satisfied. This was not the kind of thing, this was not the kind of thing where it's dinner and somebody stops by that you're not expecting to be there and you're like, uh, I don't think we have enough food. Okay, put an extra plate out and somebody throws an extra couple of potatoes in the microwave, heats them up really fast and adds an extra thing and everybody realizes, oh, I think they take a little helping oh, that was really good, I'm satisfied. I don't, I don't think that's what it was. I think that they came, and I think that, think of this, again, there's 5,000 men plus women and children. There's no way that they were able to be down front, down in the middle, down where Jesus and the disciples were to see this all unfold. That's why the Holy Spirit inspired Matthew to record this and keep this. And again, it's in the Gospels, in the, throughout the Gospels, I think, This is the one miracle that is in, one of the miracles that is in all four Gospels. And why? Because it was so profound for them to see it that they wanted even the far edges of the people who were there to realize what Christ had done, the miracle that had been done, and the fact that the one who was up front eating was just as satisfied as the one all the way in the back number 5,000 plus women and children, the very last one to get the food. 
ate and was just as satisfied as the first one to get. Is that, is that not amazing? I think there's so often, and they all ate and were satisfied. There was nobody who was like, yeah, I think I'll set this one out. I think they all ate. I think they were hungry. And I think at the end of the miracle, they were, they were all satisfied. This, this, I don't know that this is going to be as profound, but I think it's something we all need to hear. And, and, and the, first, the first point or the first kind of question that I'm using to kind of direct us is, what doesn't satisfy? What are the things in life that do not satisfy? You want to have more things, and we've talked about my violin collection. I'm, I, I haven't paid for any of them. I got nine violins. I've not paid for one of them. I mean, people have them in their closets and give them to me. And my wife said to me one day, she said, Glenn, how many, how many, how many fiddles do you need? And I, she, she said, you can only play one at a time. And I said, well, how many pairs of shoes can you wear at a time? <laughs> She's gracious and she's kind, and she reminded me in a loving way that that was not nice to say. <laughs> but, but you know what? I mean, here, here's the thing. And again, whatever your thing is that you say, if I just had this one more, it would satisfy. If I had one more tool in my wood shop, if I had one more skein of yarn, if I had one more different kind of a needle, one that curves around so I can do this, if I had one more kind of pot in the kitchen, if I had uh, one more chair or um, uh, decoration outside, if I had one more, you know what, you know what I'm going, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to include all of you uh, because <laughs> I'm telling you what, this is just... What, what are the things that don't satisfy? And, and ask yourself this question. Honestly, this is not Glenn pointing and saying, you need, to, you, know, you need to have fewer shoes or fewer pots or fewer violins. It's, it's for all of us. I look in the mirror when I'm pointing and I see this and feel this back at me. Is there anything that I have pursued in life apart from Christ that satisfies me? No. And so some, one of the things that I thought about was, thought about money. Money doesn't satisfy. You know, I, I, I think I've heard somebody say, you know, that, that uh, money can't buy happiness. And, and I said, yeah, but money could buy a new violin, and that's about the same as happiness. <laughs> and then my wife reminds me, and, and again, money, money doesn't buy happiness. One, one writer said this. Let me read this. Um, when I was in college, I read the poem of Richard Corey. Some of you know the, the poem, the pressing poem. From the outside looking in, he had it all together. Had stuff, was, was cordial, polite, and yet at the end, he takes his life because it wasn't as good as what everybody might have thought. Somebody, somebody said, I read this in, a, um, in an article, it said, people often compare their wealth to others. And once they reach a certain level of wealth, they may start comparing themselves to even wealthier individuals, which can lead to a feeling, uh, to feelings of dissatisfaction. You know, it starts out that you compare yourself to the neighbors on the left and on the right and across the road, and all of a sudden, when you have a have more money and more stuff than them, then you're like, well, let's let's go outside the town. Let's let's look at who is the richest person in my city. Ecclesiastes chapter five reminds us. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity, or this also is worthless. Money, money doesn't satisfy. Do we need money? Yes. We need money to pay bills, to be able to you know, do some things that we want to be able to do. But friends, if you are thinking that if you get one more dollar in your account, everything's going to be better, I'm here to tell you, that you'll get that dollar and you'll look back and you'll say, I, I, that's not it. Maybe it's one more. And friends, I just want to tell you, again, we need, we need money to be able to pay bills, but please, please, please do not put that at the top of your list of this is what I need so that I can be, that I can be satisfied. Money does not satisfy. Another thing that I see that does not satisfy is pride. Pride doesn't satisfy. We think, 
We've got titles, we've got reputation, we've got position within the community, we've got status among our friends and our relatives, and like Richard uh, Corey, we walk into a room and people are like, wow, that's him, that's that's, that's her, she's that. We can get kind of puffed up about that. Um, Usually about the time that happens to me and I walk in somewhere and I think, I'm all that in a bag of chips. I will trip on nothing on the floor, stumble like that, and everybody's looking at you, and I'm like, you know, I think I'll just go sit down so I don't hurt myself or anyone else. We need to keep in perspective who we are. The proud person despises learning new things. The proud person will say, you know, I already have a handle on this. I don't need you to teach me anything new. By teaching you about, you know, teach, teaching me about the things of God, I read through the Bible one time. I know everything there is to know about it. Really? I mean, I, I still don't know. And, and, and just as honesty, the more I read, the more I realize I don't know. Amen? And the more God keeps teaching me, and I'm amazed at what he shows me and teaches me, they despise new learning. We, a proud person will often put themselves, when I've been prideful and God has convicted me of that, I've said, well, I'm here and that person is here. We see that pecking order of where, of where we are. And as a result, the destruction is waiting. The fall is waiting to happen. We don't need help from anybody. We can do this all on our own. Pride does not satisfy. We know the verse. Read this along with me. Proverbs 16, verse 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Friends, if you think of yourself more highly than you ought, realize that you can do that in and of yourself, but that's not from God. That is not from God. And, and, and also, be, be very careful Because when you're in that place and you think you are untouchable and above everyone else, it does not take much for your legs to be swept out from underneath you and reminded you're not not all that. Another thing that does not satisfy is sin. Sin does not satisfy. We talked about this at the beginning just a little bit. A guy in Kentucky one of the attorneys, new attorney that I worked with for a very short time, um, he started seeing somebody else other than his wife. And he confided in one of the other attorneys who had no problem at all dating lots and lots of ladies. And he said, you know, it's kind of fun and exciting and she's young and it's neat, we can go out. And the guy said to him, what do you think you're doing. The guy who was chastising the other guy was not a Christian at the time. He said, what are you doing? He said, you made a commitment to love her till death do you part. He goes, well, you know, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the worst that happened was his wife came home early, sick from work one day, and as she walked in the door, she yelled out to her husband, and she heard the jingle of a belt buckle in the back room and everything in his world fell apart. Why? Because sin does not satisfy. We we in the church need to be clear on this. I think that we are not as vocal about it as we should be. Some of us have scars from sin in our lives. I jumped up and down on the bed when I was a little kid against the rules of my mom and dad and split my head open. I have a scar on my forehead. When you walk out, you'll see it, and you'll be like, oh, yep, there it is, because it was really fun for a little bit, and then it wasn't. There's there's no satisfaction in sin. It doesn't satisfy. This is a longer passage, but I I want you to hear this. God is speaking to Ezekiel. Ezekiel is speaking to the people of Israel and telling them, again, some of the language in this is like, whoa, did he just say that? Yep, I'm going to go there. Ezekiel chapter 16, 
You don't have to turn it. You can write it down and just, again, read on the screen. Again, he's talking to the children of Israel, God's chosen people. Look at this. You played the whore with the Egyptians. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not on any Hallmark card. <laughs> I mean, for, for God to say this through the prophet, he was not being politically correct. He was calling sin, sin. And when we within the church are dabbling with sin, we are whoring with the enemy against what God wants us to do. We need to call it what it is. It's like, well, I don't like being called a whore. Well, are you living faithfully to the God who saved you? God called it like he saw it. He said, you also played the whore with the Egyptians. You lustful, your lustful neighbors multiplying your whoring. So it wasn't just a little bit. It was a little bit and a little bit more and more and more and more to provoke me, provoke God, to anger. Behold, therefore, I stretched out my hand against you and diminished your uh, allotted portion and delivered you to the greed of your enemies, the daughters of the Philistines, who were ashamed of your lewd behavior. So did you catch that? The Philistines, who were not godly people, were seeing the sinful whoring of the Israelites, of God's people, and they were ashamed and embarrassed, and they were like, that's not the way it should be. I promise you, if you are a child of God, if you, if, even if you come here and you're not a Christian, you've not accepted Christ as your Savior, but people in your family and your community know that you come to Chapmanville, know that you go to church, know that you're kind of a churchy person, if your walk is not consistent with what God's Word says, the unsaved world around us, they see it, and they are not impressed by it. They're not impressed by it. Somewhere along the way, when we as the church said, if I, if I act more like the world around me, if I act more like the sinful world around me, I'll have a better rapport. I'll be able to be on the same plane. We'll be able to talk, and they'll, they'll understand me. And I'll, Friends, they need to understand the Word of God being lived out without apology and without compromise in the lives of believers around the world. And it starts with me, and it starts with you going into our community. God, God, wasn't, God wasn't beating around the bush. They were, they were ashamed of your lewd behavior. He goes on. doesn't stop there. Verse 28, you played the whore also with the Assyrians. So it wasn't just with the Egyptians. It's with the Assyrians as well because you were not, you're not satisfied. You're like, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to, I'm going to go live a, a, a sinful world and, and buy into all of the, um, all the teachings and the ways of the Egyptians. I'm going to have altars and, and uh, false gods just like them. You say, well, we don't have false, false gods. Do we? I mean, do, do, we, do we worship our job, our health, our youth, our home, our finances? Our, have we put that on a pedestal that we would compromise our integrity to preserve, to preserve whatever it is that we're holding on to more than God? And so they weren't satisfied. Yes, he goes on. Yes, you played the whore with them, and you still, you still were not satisfied. You multiplied your whoring. I mean, you know, I, I think he's getting the point, right? He keeps saying it again and again. I mean, you guys are going to leave and be like, I don't know what he talked about today, but he said the word whore or whoring an awful lot. Well, it's not me, it's God. But so let the Holy Spirit prick my heart and prick our hearts today. You multiplied your whoring also with the trading, uh, with the trading land of, of Chaldea. And even with this, you were not satisfied. See, as I said earlier, Hebrews 11 tells us, by faith Moses, when he had grown up, he refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter and instead chose to be part of the Hebrew people, to be mistreated with the people of God. He chose that rather than, and Hebrew says, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, rather than to have the comfortable life in Egypt where he would have been second in line. He might have even been the ruler in Egypt at some, day, at some point. And he said, that's not right. I'm going to go back and identify with my, with my people. Sin 
sin doesn't satisfy, pride doesn't satisfy, and certainly money does not satisfy. Well, that, that leads us to then the question of well, what does satisfy? What does satisfy? 